So he's going to help us. Hello, everyone. How are we? We're great when technology works. <laughs> it will soon. Um, we're just trying to display from the computer up, so a little glitch, but we'll get that going in a few minutes. Um, I'm Amy Burrows, school superintendent, so thank you for coming. And it's such an important topic as far as the dangers of vaping, and it's definitely a discussion that's been ongoing um, at all levels, especially middle school and high school. So this evening from the Southeast Tobacco Coalition, we have Melissa Vidal, she's going to be presenting, and this is in uh, partnership with the Foxborough Board of Health. So I'd like to welcome you, and then we'll have the screen projected just as soon as we can, but I'll turn it over to Melissa. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, so my name is Marissa. I'm the program manager of the Southeast Tobacco Free Community Partnership. Um, I cover the entire Southeast region of Massachusetts, and part of my job is to provide this education for youth prevention, um, talking with parents, talking to schools and other adults in the community, um, and particularly talking about this epidemic that we're facing right now with youth vaping. Um, kind of to take it back a couple steps before we really get into what vaping is, what the products look like, and all of those details, I wanna just quickly go over basically why we are where we are right now. Um, so the tobacco industry and the vaping industry are one and the same. Um, they spend a real lot of money to very intentionally target young people with products that are sweet, cheap, and easy to get. Those are like the three, um, the three tactics that they use. Um, they know that the main reason that young people under 25 start to use tobacco or nicotine products, um, that main reason is flavors. Um, they know that youth are very price sensitive. Um, cheaper products, young people are more likely to buy. Um, and they know that easily accessible products, so products that can be found at Cumberland Farms or corner stores or really easily purchased online, um, not only the easy access does it sort of normalize the use of these products, but it also, of course, makes it easy for um, kids to get the products. Um, I'll kind of come back to that a little once we get the computer screen up so you can see um, some of the numbers and some of the data. Um, and in the meantime, I'll just jump ahead right into um, vaping um, and these flavored tobacco products. So you, I'm assuming you all have heard of vaping because you're here, right? Um, have you all seen products? Have you seen the vapes? Have you seen jewels? Okay, so not everyone. So when I pass stuff around, um, I just ask that if it is in a plastic bag, that you just leave it in the bag. Um, that means it's leaking. Um, if it's not in a bag, some of the e-liquids that I will pass around, you can open up and smell. Um, and I'm gonna start off with just a real basic, what is vaping? Um, so vaping is, and a vaping device is, first of all, not always called vaping. Um, a vape is an e-cigarette, a jewel is an e-cigarette. Um, they go by many names, a lot of times they're called actually by the brand, such as Juul or Blue or Fix um, or Logic. There's many, many, many brands. Um, and it's important to realize that when thinking and talking about and to young people and their use of these products. Um, it's important to understand that there's not a one size fits all label or like way of talking about it. Um, so the real, real basic way that an e-cigarette works is there's a battery which heats flavored liquid nicotine. It turns that flavored liquid nicotine into an aerosol, not a vapor. So it's an aerosol. And then the user of the device inhales and then exhales the aerosol. I'm going to pass around just a real easy to see e-cigarette. Actually, I'll pass around two. So on this one, you can see the battery is down here. This is where the flavored uh, liquid nicotine would go, and this is the mouthpiece. There's a button to turn it on. And then same thing with this one, just a different shape. So the, the two e-cigarettes that I just passed around, those have uh, areas where, you, where the user of the device adds in a flavored liquid nicotine themselves. They, they choose the flavor, the flavors are sold in bottles, which I will pass around in a minute. Um, and that's one type of e-cigarette where you, you fill it in yourself, right? And then there's um, 
there's pod-based systems. So the Juul, which is really, really popular among high schoolers, has pods that are specifically compatible, compatible with the Juul device. They're made for the Juul, and they're pre-filled with the flavored liquid nicotine. Once the pod is empty, you throw it out, and you refill it. Just a quick note about the Juul specifically, one pod has about as much nicotine as an entire pack of cigarettes. I'll pass around the pods in just a second so you can see them, the size of them, and the device. Um, but what I've heard from high schoolers in a number of different high schools that I've visited um, and, and talked with kids at is that they're going through these pods, so nicotine equivalent of a pack of cigarettes, in as little as an hour to inhale this aerosol from the Juul or any other vape device, um, you don't get the same abrasiveness as you do with a traditional combustible cigarette. It tastes fruity, not like cigarette smoke, of course. Um, and so it's real easy to consume a whole lot of nicotine in a really short span of time. So I'm gonna grab the Juul and pass that around. This is the jewel. This is the charger. It just comes right off, it's magnetic. And it plugs into the side of a computer right where my flash drive is. It's a USB charge and it just sticks right in there. This is the jewel pod and this one's empty, um, but they just stick right in there and then the mouthpiece is at the end of the flavor pod. And this is a box of the pods. You can take the pods out of the box and read the box if you want. Um, and this is the creme brulee flavor. So are they all nicotine or are they just flavored? The flavor right. always has nicotine in it? So the Juul specifically, yes. Always nicotine in the Juul. There is no such thing as a Juul without nicotine. And actually, um, there was a, a study that found actually 63% of Juul users don't even realize that the product always contains nicotine. There's no such thing as a nicotine-free jewel, right? Um, with the flavors that you fill into um, one of the e-cigarettes that I passed around at first, um, those th technically could be nicotine-free. However, there is not regulation and there's no oversight. Um, and in the PowerPoint, I'll, I'll show you um, the bottles themselves can actually be labeled as containing no nicotine and then you turn it to the back and the last ingredient listed is nicotine or it's not listed at all, but when tested, there really is nicotine. So these are just two of the flavors that I'm talking about. I'm gonna open this one. Hopefully you can tell what it's gonna smell like by looking at it. Um, it smells just like Sour Patch Kids. Um, Mm. Kind of thing is that one for? Yeah, so it's it's nicotine. So there's a there's a buzz. Nicotine is a stimulant, um, and there is a buzz associated. Yeah, uh, but I will say, just we're talking about vaping nicotine. Um, but all of these devices, whether they are a pre-filled pod device or a device where you put in your own liquid, you can vape any liquid. So you can vape THC, you can vape heroin, you can vape any liquid. So just keeping that in mind. So I'm gonna pass these around. Just be careful with the one that's open. How much is this, the four pods? The four pods are about 12 to $15. Yeah, and the device itself is about 45. Um, a, what I've heard uh, across the board pretty much is that high schoolers um, will like either share the device or pool their money, um, either sharing the pods themselves or actually just buying their own individual pods and just sharing the hardware, so the battery, um, to make it basically more cost effective um, by, by splitting the cost of something that's $45, you can really make it quite affordable. Um, so in Foxborough, the minimum legal sales age is 21. Um, in over 200 
municipalities in Massachusetts, the age of sale was raised right up to 21, but the state law that went into effect at the end of 2018 raised the age to 21 with a grandfather clause. So in those towns that didn't pass the stronger regulation, basically, um, 18, 19, and 20 year olds can still buy, but Foxborough's at 21 already. Yeah. Um, all right, so. Yeah. No. So any town that passed the, the stronger regulation with a, an effective date before the state law doesn't have the grandfather clause. So most of the state, it's like over 85% of the state's population is in a stronger regulation area, which is really great. But that's not to say that, I mean, obviously kids are still getting these products, right? So with the minimum legal sales age, that's one aspect of it. And there's also, kids know older kids. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of kids in high school, the 18 year olds who basically were supplying these devices for their younger classmates and friends um, and, and kids find a way. Also, there are still um, illegal sales. That's, that still does happen. So this next device that I'm gonna show you um, is called the Blue and it's, it's pretty much the same shape and size as the Jewel. It comes with the pod and a charger in this starter pack. And um, for a while, this starter pack was $1 for the whole thing, for the device, the charger, and a pod. And now how much is it? Uh, yeah, it, it, the, it was a promotion that they were doing for a while. Um, and I, I have a picture of it in here too, sorry that we don't have this, um, the visuals to go along with it right now, but really I wanna make the point that the industry Spends a lot of money to get kids hooked on these products. One dollar, any high schooler, any middle schooler can come up with one dollar. Um, and it only takes about two to three weeks to start to develop a nicotine addiction. A nicotine addiction happens fast and when, and I'm sure you've all probably heard from at least one young person that it's just water vapor. Um, if a child, teenager, young adult, begins using nicotine under the misinformed idea that it's water vapor and develops an addiction real quickly, um, then they're in a whole, a whole bunch of trouble. They're, they have a nicotine addiction. Um, nicotine, particularly when the brain is still developing, can lead to real long-term damage. It can permanently lower impulse control. It can permanently disrupt the way that the brain is able to learn. It disturbs um, the way synapses are formed in the area of the brain that specifically controls learning. Um, it can cause mood disorders such as anxiety and depression. Um, lots of trouble concentrating in class when you're thinking about the short term. Um, if kids are jittery, um, having trouble focusing if they're feeling withdrawal and need to start to use. Thank you. Um, need to start to use uh, nicotine again. Um, so p impacting their performance on the day to day, but also long term. Um, and, and nicotine use and nicotine addiction before the brain is fully developed um, can actually prime the pathways in the brain for future addiction to other substances and other drugs. So I'm just gonna kind of find my spot in the PowerPoint real quick. Um, So just quickly looking at this picture, um, going back to the sweet category that I mentioned, um, just really showing how easily the packaging blends in. We've got candy, chapstick, and tobacco products in this picture, um, and it, it blends right in. And then next, um, we have here some data showing that flavors really do appeal mostly to young people. Um, the graph over on the Right hand side, the top, top category, I think it says 25 to 29 year olds, um, is who uses flavored tobacco products the most, right? This is, this is young people. And I already mentioned, the flavors make these products seem harmless. Um, they normalize it. It's, there's not the same association with tobacco and nicotine. 
when you ask young people about regular combustible cigarettes, pretty much all high schoolers will tell you, no, that's gross, I don't do that, I know that cigarettes are bad for me. Um, but if you, if you ask them about vaping and e-cigarettes, there's not that same perception of harm at all. Well, the problem is when you smoke a cigarette, you come home, you smell like cigarettes. Right. Vaping, you don't smell it. Right, and that's, that's exactly right. And it's not even just at home. It's in the hallway at school. It's on the school bus. It's everywhere. The, the, these don't smell like cigarettes. They smell like perfume or fruity hand sanitizer. Like a student can quite literally use this in class, blow it into the corner of their arm or down their sweatshirt or whatever, um, and a teacher or bus driver wouldn't necessarily see this big puff of vapor, which is actually an aerosol. They just smell mango, right? It's really, really hard to detect. And the device that I passed around, the Juul specifically, it's so small, as you saw, it can fit right in the palm of your hand, it can fit right up your sleeve, it's really easy to conceal. Um, also to see it like at the bottom of a backpack or um, on a desk even, it looks like a piece of technology that if someone doesn't know exactly what they're looking for, you could not at all know it was an e-cigarette. This picture is just showing you um, I particularly look at the jam flavors. It looks just like Smucker's jam, um, just to give you some more examples of sweet, um, that category of tactics that we talked about. Um, so as of this summer, 106 municipalities had actually restricted the sale of flavored tobacco products to adult-only stores. So that's something that towns can do to really decrease the accessibility of these products put them only in stores where you need an ID to get in. We already talked about the price. Um, this is showing you a picture of a coupon. Um, that's not uncommon. And then here's that $1 starter kit. What? The flavor restriction? No. Not that I'm aware of. So um, gas stations, corner stores. Right. So the so Juul specifically, as a brand, not as a law or, or anything like that, but Juul specifically um, is only selling mint and tobacco flavored pods in uh, retail stores, just they, because they're getting so much attention and you know they are clearly targeting kids. So they've pulled those mango. Uh, creme brulee, those other flavors besides mint and tobacco out. Um, however, they didn't take the products away. So whatever stores had, they can still sell. But there are plenty of other brands besides Juul um, that are selling mango or passion fruit or whatever um, at those types of stores. Um, yeah. Online. Yes. This, um, this is from their website. Um, you can buy these online. Recently, there has been a lot of attention on this issue and a bit stronger uh, regulating of the issue, basically. Um, so when I first started giving these presentations, I started this job over the summer. When I very first started, I went onto Jewel's website and I tried to go through the process of buying a Jewel um, just to see what you had to do. And all you had to do was check a box saying, yes, I'm 18. They've since added more that you need to do. Um, but before that, kids could just check that box and use a prepaid gift card, like those Visa gift cards that you buy at whatever Walmart. Um, and a parent would not know, necessarily. Um, kids whose parents are um, at work until 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock, the delivery could come before the parents get home. Or if their parents are home, they'd have it delivered to a friend's house who they know um, their parents aren't home. So they could get the package from the mail without you know, an adult knowing. But yeah, they are, they are sold online. So something that we actually haven't talked about yet, because um, it's really not as big of a thing as the vapes, is real cheap single cigars um, and blunt wraps. Um, these are also flavored. 
Something that towns can do is, number one, they can just ban the sale of blunt wraps, but they can also um, put minimum pricing requirements on cheap little cigars. So they're, without the price, minimum pricing, they can be 49 cents, 69 cents, um, and they, towns can put into place a regulation to have minimal two for 250. Um, one for 250 I'm sorry, or two for $5, making it not as easy to just, I mean, anyone can find 50 cents, right? Um, so that's just one thing that some towns can do. And How we... The little cigars and the blunt wraps, so um, they're, they're common, they're not as common as vaping, um, and basically what, they, what they're used for is to smoke marijuana. They will push out the tobacco and fill the flavor with, the flavored wrap with um, marijuana. So you're still getting the nicotine, but then also the marijuana. Yes, you would smell dry marijuana. However, THC oil, when put in a vape, you wouldn't smell in the same way at all. There are some vape devices, I don't have any, but there are some that are actually meant to vape dry marijuana, and that you would smell less than smoking dry marijuana because to vape the dry marijuana, it just heats it, it doesn't burn it. Um, so that would be a little less, and then the THC oil would not smell, like the stereotypical smell. Um, so we know that price increases are effective. Um, each 10% increase in price results in about a 7% reduction in youth smoking um, with cigarettes. So, I mean, we know that youth are extremely price sensitive. So um, for municipalities to put this regulation into place is really important. Just like putting the flavor restriction into place, really important. These are strategies that we know work. <coughs> So um, just before we get right back into vaping, just one last slide from this beginning section. I'm showing you advertising dollars and e-cigarette use among youth, right? Um, the tobacco industry spends a ton of money specifically targeting 14-year-olds. Young teenagers, they're, they're vulnerable. They're trying to figure out their place in the world. Um, they become addicted and then the industry knows they have a customer for 20 to 30 years. Um, it's a very intentional strategy. As of 2017, about 20% of Massachusetts high schoolers uh, are currently using e-cigarettes. When compared with cigarettes, that no the number for cigarettes is under 7%, so it's much more e-cigarettes. That middle bar, the any tobacco products, um, that's the blunt wraps that we talked about. That's chew, dip, little cigars. So that is less also than vapes. Still happening, but not as much. And the data that we had from 2015, we don't yet have the data from 2017 comparing adult use and youth use, but in 2015, youth use was nine times higher than adult use of e-cigarettes. So we went over what is vaping already. It's that aerosol being inhaled and then exhaled. This picture is just showing you really like the range of what these devices can look like. I'm gonna pass around a couple more examples for you to see. This is obviously a much larger device. Um, just don't take it out of the bag. This was confiscated somewhere and it's leaking. <laughs> um, this one is called a Soren Air. Very small, very sleek, very easy to conceal. The top part, the black piece, is the cartridge where the flavored liquid nicotine is. And then, this device and the blue one, the other blue one in my hand that I'm gonna pass around are also Soren, but these are teardrop flavored. So um, if you've ever seen the flavored water drops, I think the brand is Mio, that you dump in your water. These are like the same size and shape. Um, they would, at a, at a quick glance, it would look like the same thing in someone's backpack, basically. And those bags that I just passed around, you can probably smell the liquid right through the bag if you want to. 
All right. So we talked about the two different types of rechargeable devices. The rechargeable devices such as the Juul that have cartridges that are pre-filled and then the devices that are um, you put in your own liquid. There are also disposable devices. So way back at the beginning of e-cigarettes, they first came out looking like regular cigarettes, except they were electronic. They were meant for one-time use. Um, you can't recharge it. You just use it and then toss it. So I'll pass that around for you too. And it, it looks just like a cigarette. A lot of these um, will light up at the end to really like just mimic the regular experience of a combustible. We already talked about the Juul. Um, I'll just say it again, one pod is about as much nicotine as a pack of cigarettes. Um, that's a lot of nicotine. And um, the larger device that I passed around, um, you can probably guess already, is not quite as popular. It's not as easy to conceal. Um, you might see older, like 20, 30, and older than that, people using the larger devices when um, concealing them is not really a factor. Um, but just so you're aware that they are out there. Again, just some more pictures of the liquids. And the products are always constantly evolving. Um, they, really any like shape, tech looking device that you might see, um, take a second look at it because it may be an e-cigarette. Um, we just, it's, it's always sort of a game of catch up, um, always putting out new products, new designs. Um, I'm gonna pass around just this other uh, little flavor cartridge actually just so you can smell it. Um, it's passion fruit or tropical something. Um, which is just compatible with another device. This graphic is showing you um, just the basic way that the e-cigarettes work. Um, we already went over it, um, but just so you can visually see it, just really simply, the, ba the battery heats the flavored liquid nicotine, turns it into that aerosol, inhaled and then exhaled. So what is actually in the aerosol, right? What are you inhaling other than nicotine when you use these products? Um, there, there's nicotine, of course. Um, there's also um, diacetyl, which is a flavoring linked to popcorn lung. Popcorn lung is a permanent scarring of the lungs. Um, there is propylene glycol. When propylene glycol is heated to a certain temperature that these um, vape devices can get up to, it can actually produce formaldehyde. There is vegetable glycerin, which your body can digest, but when heated and aerosolized, your lungs don't have the capacity to deal with that or filter it out. Um, there's ultrafine particles, there are, um, there's benzene, which is uh, an organic compound which is in car exhausts. And all of these devices have batteries. And the nickel, lead, and tin from the batteries are also being inhaled and getting lodged into the lungs. The user of a vape or e-cigarette inhales this aerosol and then they exhale it. So not all of it is staying trapped in the lungs. So the second hand vape is not harmless. The um, Surgeon General's report did state that it's not harmless. Um, so similarly to cigarette, secondhand cigarette smoke, um, you don't want to be around secondhand vape. Um, these next two slides, we kind of already went over the nicotine. Sorry, I'm a little out of order without the PowerPoint today. Um, but uh, again, nicotine is a real, real serious addiction. Um, it's extremely, extremely hard to quit, and it's really quick to get addicted to. Um, and young people really need to know that these products do contain nicotine. Um, it's just such a widespread misperception that there's just water vapor, um, and that's it can be really, really dangerous for young people to go into using something like this, not realizing what they are actually doing. So it's just super important to talk to kids and give them the facts, share with them the facts. This is the picture that I mentioned earlier of the bottle of e-liquid. It says right at the top, I don't know if you can read it. 
Yeah, it looks pretty good. Um, it says this product does not contain nicotine, and then the last ingredient is actually nicotine. So it's really blatant, um, but if you only read the first sentence, you wouldn't know. There was also um, a study done of 10 different disposable e-cigarette brands which were all labeled as containing no nicotine, and nine of those 10 did contain nicotine, despite being labeled as not containing nicotine. The CDC has said that e-cigarettes are not safe for um, youth, young adults, uh, pregnant women, or anyone who doesn't already use tobacco. Um, secondhand vape is unsafe, and what it really comes down to at this point is we do not have long-term data here. We don't have years and years and years of research like we do about regular cigarettes. Um, what we know for sure already is not good, um, and likely what we will continue to find out is that it's even more not good. Um, like I said, you can vape anything that's a liquid. Um, open systems, so the device that's meant to add your own liquid in, it's real easy to do, but the, the Juul or any other pod-based system, um, it's frankly not difficult to hack it. And once it's empty, just fill it with whatever you want. Um, there's plenty of ways to find out that information on the internet or by asking your friends. Um, so how, how can you tell if someone's vaping? Um, we talked about how you wouldn't smell cigarette smoke. Um, it's really easy to know when someone is smoking a cigarette. Um, basically, if you are smelling something that's an unexplained sweet smell, um, investigate that a little further. If it's a sweet smell at a weird time, you don't see uh, any reason for it, look into it a little more. Any tech looking devices that you don't recognize, look at that with um, a more critical eye. Um, and I think it's in a slide a little further, but just ask. It's, it's so important to just talk to kids and just ask them. Um, teenagers really do care about their parents' approval. Um, it's, it's important that they know that it's not safe and that you don't approve of them doing it. You don't want them to fall into this um, target, basically. I mean, they are being explicitly targeted. Um, so like I mentioned before, we know basically what to do. We know the regulations that we need to put into place. Um, we know that understanding the issue as parents, as teachers, as members of the community is so important. Um, and we know that getting youth involved on a peer-to-peer -peer level is really productive. So there's this group called the 84 Movement. Has anyone heard of it? So it's, um, it's a high school, it's a group of high schoolers in Massachusetts. There's chapters in a bunch of different high schools and they do trainings and workshops and they can apply for mini grants and it's all anti-vaping and anti-tobacco work that they do within the school. In the spring, we go to the state house and members of these groups actually talk to their legislators about what they're seeing in their communities. Um, they testify at public hearings at the Board of Health. So if the Board of Health were thinking about putting in some stronger regulations, the youth would actually go and talk to the board. Um, and then they can do a project with these mini grants actually in the school. So if there is a SAD chapter or a peer leadership group or really any group that would be interested in anti-vaping or anti-tobacco at the high school. Um, if anyone knows of anything like that, um, just let me know afterwards or uh, mention it to your kids if they're in any sort of group like that. Um, and we can kind of try and get that started if there's not one. Another thing that's really important is to know both the state laws and the local regulations. Um, so the state law that went into effect at the end of 2018, like I mentioned, raised the minimum legal sales age to 21 with that grandfather clause. So any towns that didn't already have the age at 21 got raised to 21, um, except 18, 19, and 20 year olds um, if they had already turned 18 before the law went into effect. 
It also included um, e-cigarettes in the definition of tobacco, and it really importantly expanded the smoke-free workplace law to include e-cigarettes. So anywhere that you can't smoke a cigarette now, you also cannot use an e-cigarette, which is huge. Um, it also banned the sale of tobacco products in pharmacies. Massachusetts is the first state in the country to do so, so that's also really huge. Um, Foxborough had already done that as well, which is great. Um, and then if you want to know more specifically about your town, makesmokinghistory.org um, has maps and all the regulations that you can search, you can look at the neighboring towns, um, it's all up there. We already talked about the 84. And again, I just really want to stress the importance of talking to kids. Um, ask them what they see, ask them what their friends are doing. Um, be really, really honest with um, you know, it's, it is harmful. It's an addiction. Nicotine is one of the hardest substances to quit. Um, starting to use nicotine before the brain is fully developed can lead to permanent damage to their brain. Um, not to scare kids, but to empower them with the information that they need to make these decisions um, that, you know, will impact them for a real long time. And it also really helps to be really explicit that they're being targeted. Nobody likes to feel like they are um, like being fooled, right? No, no teenager wants to, I mean, no person really wants to feel like they are being tricked into doing something that's bad for them. And you can break down the, um, the money. You can do out the equation. Um, and that's kind of a shocker sometimes. You can also look up popcorn long and there are pictures on the internet which are really scary. No one, no one would want that. So it's just, it's important to, get, to give your children and your children's friends and whoever, any young people you know, information so that they can make good decisions. So I'm gonna leave this particular slide up. Um, and I also, I think when you came in, there were some materials in the back. Um, the getoutrage.org site is listed on some of those materials. And on that website, there is a whole bunch of information. There are fact sheets, there are pictures, there are um, tips for these conversations. There's actually a whole toolkit that schools can use. Part of that toolkit is a health curriculum, which is called Catch My Breath. I'm not sure if that's already in the high school or middle school, but there are uh, both versions available for free online. Um, it's four lessons. It's great to just put into a health curriculum um, and get some education in the schools specifically about e-cigarettes. Um, and then there are a couple of other free curriculum also listed in that toolkit as well. Um, all of the, the like flyers, the not the stuff printed out from a printer that was back there, can be ordered for free at the Massachusetts Clearinghouse um, if you were to ever need more of it. And then again, makesmokinghistory.org um, basically has everything that I've said and more up there. I think that's it. So yeah, I'll leave, I'll leave this slide up here. And then um, actually one more thing is um, Smoke Free Teen is a website um, for teenagers who are addicted to nicotine. So of course there's the conversation of what do we do now. Um, Smoke Free Teen is a really great site. The main thing that we do refer people to is the child's pediatrician. If your teenager is addicted to vaping, um, have a conversation with them and their doctor about that. Um, there's also a new resource, which I do have information printed out about on that back table from the Truth Initiative, um, a texting counseling service that was just put out um, through the Truth Initiative for teenagers who are addicted as well. So that's brand new and it's um, great that we're getting some more resources. Um, but as you know, this issue came really fast and really broadly. So we are trying to catch up, basically. Um, so the education is really, really important. Do you guys have questions? Yeah. Um, we've discussed it a few meetings, and we did see the, the petitions that literally hundreds of parents signed, and I would sign it myself. My kids are all big now. Um, so we've talked about it at our, at our board meetings a bunch of times. Actually, at our last meeting, we were very close to just banning them all together. But then there was some, um, you know, we had some lawyers and stuff in the room. And there was talk of um, 
and I think Somerville is actually going through this right now. I think Somerville's Board of Health voted to, voted to ban them altogether, and now they're being inundated with lawsuits. So we're not just the Board of Health, we're, we're Foxborough citizens, and at that point we just didn't feel right opening the town up to a whole bunch of lawsuits, because I don't want to pay for that, and I'm sure you don't either. I'm kind of curious as to how they can do a lawsuit when they're suffering to underage. Well, they're not. It's 21 in Foxborough. Right. And we well, do we're a lot of high school students, so I'm kind of confused. I'm sorry? The, well, we're talking high, I mean, we have high school students. We have students right. So they, are they, if they're getting them, they're getting them illegally. It's just like when a high school kid gets beer. Right. You know, they're getting it from an older person. But the, it's really hard to control that. But we, we, we do three or four compliance checks. I think there's 16 or 17. Um, Places in town that sell tobacco, and um, you know they're all over 21. We don't have any adult-only tobacco stores in the town of Foxborough. Um, but the petition was to make it so that the tobacco products could only be sold in the stores where other products that only one-year-olds, 21-year-olds could purchase, i.e., liquor stores. It doesn't. It, the petition doesn't ask you to say. I get it. I get so it. So where, how does this petition that's been signed by hundreds of people get action? Um, it, the Board of Health will need to take action on that. We debated it and debated it, and we get a lot of people pushing us one way, a lot of people pushing us the other way. It's it's complicated. I, I invite you all to come to any Board of Health meeting when that particular stuff is <coughs>
let me understand that. So the losses are coming from tobacco companies. Yes. Because I'm wondering who's suing. I mean, who's going to, I'm not going to sue an so, underage kid who gets something that shouldn't even happen. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's the companies who so are, the tobacco companies who are big suing. Big corporations who will sue the, the town tobacco. so they're still made. Yeah. Because not so, the individual person. Right, right. So, um, just kind of to clarify a little bit, Somerville and the conversation, um, there's one, what Somerville is doing is banning altogether, right? And the flavor restriction of just only selling flavored products in an adult only establishment, um, those are different things. Um, the flavor restriction, um, the language that Cheryl and DJ, the attorneys that we work with, um, the language that they provide for that. Um, one in Providence, so we're in the same court district as Providence. Um, it's it's been tested. We we won. The they were sued, um, and the industry didn't win. So the flavor restriction is different than the outright ban. They're definitely getting sued um, with the ban outright, and a lot of municipalities are kind of waiting to see what happens with that. Like you said, yeah. Yeah, that um, that language, they Providence was sued and won. So we just stick to that exact language with the restriction to adult only establishments. For the flavor restriction to adult only, yes. Like cigarettes, you mean? Yeah. So. So it's just it's just that it hasn't been done yet, right? So um, Somerville pioneering this um, will hopefully win their lawsuit, um, and then if they do, then other places can use that same language, right? So That's the is hope. Is there anything in the legislature in Massachusetts right now being pursued, like our alcohol restrictions? You can't buy beer at Cumberland Farms. So maybe the place to do it is not at the local boards of health, but at the, the state so, legislature that will work with our state rep and our state senator. Yeah, so actually um, what we saw in Massachusetts is the momentum from the local municipalities right. um, actually led to the state taking action. So it's been for years and years that local municipalities have been raising the age up to 21. And then finally the state did it. So it actually is really, really important on the town level to make these changes and build the momentum and like show the legislators for the state, how important it is. What about schools? Like, um, do we, I mean, you're saying we're talking to our kids. We're yeah. We're talking to our kids, but are like, you know, how there is the health classes and mm -hmm. stuff. Or is there anybody who talks to them about what the danger of vaping is? So. Is there anything like that there? Um. So there's. There's one person funded through Health Resources in Action, um, but she actually is funded to cover the whole state. She um, got a grant through CVS Health um, to, and, and what she's funded to do is implement that first lesson of the Catch My Breath curriculum. Um, and then otherwise, it's I health mean, classes. Parent, um, they, you know how they, yeah, 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 whatever you say, but mm -hmm. if it's like a coach, you know, if it's a lacrosse coach or mm -hmm. a hockey coach saying the, I mean, I don't know if there's a class, you know. Well, the MIA have rules yeah. for tobacco and alcohol they do. also apply to e-cigarettes. Mm -hmm. right? So all of the coaches, I mean, AD talks about that at athletic night in the spring and fall. So, and yeah, but but I, the superintendent will tell you what we're doing in our wellness. So we're, we're addressing that through our wellness curriculum at the middle school level well, and at well. the high school level. Yeah. Our school resource officer is very involved as well and has gone in and done lessons with all of our seventh and eighth graders um, about this. It is a conversation that takes place not just in wellness classes with all of our teachers from all of our sports and our coaches. Um, we now have this year a stricter penalty um, in the student handbook for anyone that is caught vaping where before it was detention and now it is a suspension and we've seen our numbers go down as a result of having that in our, in our handbook. The administrators will tell you that. As you heard this evening, they are very nondescript and you can hide them and students can be um, really evasive with them 
And so it is something that we're very aware of, but at the same time, we're in the business of teaching and learning, so we do that through our health and our wellness curriculum. But again, the point that was made and that, that conversation that all of you that are having with your children, it, it's so important to continue to have that conversation and not just once, just as we're doing in school over and over again. I have, I have a middle schooler, I have a high schooler, I have two kids in college, and the conversation at the dinner table, it happens a lot to the point where like, here mom goes talking about thinking again. You can't have the conversation enough. It needs to take place over and over. Just by you being here this evening and being able to gain more information to be able to continue that dialogue at home is so important. So um, thank you for coming out this evening and for the Board of Health bringing this presentation to us. Any questions that you have for any of our wellness teachers at times, do not hesitate to reach out to them. I, any, any one of us, but we will continue our school resource officer is, is very involved with the students as well. Aside from going in and teaching lessons on top of what's already taking place in the wellness curriculum. And then we have Ms. Frazier, she's one of the assistant middle school principals. If you wanted to add anything from the middle school perspective, I think at the middle school level, the kids are pretty good about coming to us and telling us, so, hey, this is happening in the bathroom right now, or, you know, you might want to check this student out today. I think that may be different at the high school level. They're probably a little bit less likely to come forward, but um, that's a big help to us, and that, that's true to the conversations that are happening at home, I think, and also in their wellness classes, but they're, they're recognizing it as unsafe behavior, so they will come forward and let us know. Um, offhand, I don't know the numbers, but we have seen a big decrease this year from last year. And I know Mrs. Meyer Pack, when she's here, she had to step out. If, if you wanted to, to reach out to her and see if she could come back in, then we, we can ask her directly too. So if I could just give um, just a little anecdote. Um, at Old Rochester Regional High School, um, last year, the school took a survey and asked students how much of their student body they thought was vaping and the numbers were in the 90s, the perception of who was vaping. And then the data that we have is about 20% actually are. So there is definitely a disconnect um, between what kids think is going on and the perception of how many of their peers are doing this and the, the reality. Um, and that misperception absolutely can fuel maybe a decision to do it if you think everyone's doing it. Um, so it is definitely important to just keep that in mind. And again, that's just an anecdote. That's just one school that told me that. Um, but just something to think about, the difference between the perception um, that can be really powerful.
No, because we, we it's it's more of an education at that point. It has to be a student that's caught up with it. Yes. Yes, if they're concerned, we'll have students that you know for any types of things will go to guidance and you know they have their ways of kind of just checking in with someone or or maybe it's it's around having a conversation that's not as pointed as I was told that, but it's again it's a supportive a, a supportive way. But it's only if they were to be caught with it would you see those kinds of. Um, Make sense. But one of the things that we would like to do, um, it, it, it is, it's very difficult. Um, you know, there have been incidences where you're quite sure that somebody's been making, but not quite. You do a search and you can't find it. Well, it's very easy when you do the mouthpieces or the cartridges, it just slips in. When we search a student, we're asking them to empty their pockets. We're not doing a pat down. Right. Um, ideally, what I'd like to get is the wand, the wand that can metal detect, because then it can be just like this and say, well, I need to take it out or I'm going to call mom or I'm calling dad and you can take it out in front of them. The schools are using them. That's, you know, another way potentially of, you can't hide it somewhere. Right. Maria's still playing and took the bathroom, the exterior doors mm -hmm. to their girls and boys bathrooms off. Not the stall doors, but the exterior doors. You go to a basketball game in Mansfield, go to use the ladies' room. There's no exterior door. Just you go in and it's open. So they can't open. We have they bathrooms that I don't I wouldn't but mind they, doing that. They would have the same problem, exact sure. problem that we're talking about here. Well I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the answer to that. But again you can still say why we can go to a stall and we still where you won't even see that they come. I don't have so here's my own personal bias with it. We have some bathrooms where if you took the door off don't have a direct shot in because the door is here, but you have to kind of go this way into the door to get into where the stalls or the urinals or whatever are. But we have some bathrooms that when you open up the door, it's a straight shot in. I don't know, it's that little bit of privacy sometimes again. Is there any privacy when they're teenagers? But still that little <coughs> privacy that I just can't do that. I just don't like the fact that there's a clear line of vision. The new schools, they're building like yeah. the, um, the airports. You know, you walk in one door and you go out the other door and you don't see directly that there are not outside doors. We were built a little bit earlier. This is the size of a friend of mine, um, the way that he figured out his son was actually gaping was because I guess the propane black hole, his lips were really chat. And it wasn't winter, he was like, why are your lips so chat? And then he searched his belongings in town. And so mm -hmm. it isn't even necessarily the smell or whatever like yeah. that his son, he just happened to notice that his lips were really chat. Yeah, that's good to know. I haven't heard that before. Yeah, I have you heard it. No, I hadn't. I've heard um, of acne. I've heard of vaping causing a lot of acne, um, just anecdotally, but I hadn't heard the chapped lips yet. So I'll mention that to people as kind of something to just keep an eye out for. Is there a test for nicotine? Like, does that show up? Um, I don't know if the drug testing is like here. No. I don't know about nicotine. No. And I can tell you in the health classes, just like with the alcohol, just like with drugs, vaping's been added in. You know, it's another piece of it. Um, it's tobacco, yes, but the kids aren't using tobacco. They're heading toward, you know, this, the e-cigarettes when it comes to it. So um, they're always kind of moving the curriculum as they need yeah, to use good. The students. We know that this is an epidemic across the country. And we are struggling just as any other school district is struggling in being able to provide education spell the myths that students have and continuing to learn with all of the changes as they go forward and we will continue to do that but we can't do it alone it does take all of us it takes the partnership with you and the conversations to be ongoing and for us as we were talking about before, before continuing to look at our curriculum being in um, partnership with our law enforcement as they are they come in like I said uh, officer as you know doing lessons within the class being there, talking with kids just at lunch. So those are all really important conversations because you don't know which conversation might make the difference. So it is something that we will continue to um, fight that fight 
with and continue to update our curriculum with some of the things that were mentioned. We've done that, we've sat down with them and they're taking those resources and using those within our curriculum. But again, it, it will take all of us. And things are, just to let you know too, things are being shared school to school. Um, there are monthly principal meetings that I'm at, the superintendent's meetings that they're at. And um, this is like one of the topics, it's, it's every month that's on our plate of, of what's happening your way. Are you doing something else? Have you heard of anything? So it's something that we're all, um, you know, very much just, it, it is, it's, it's all of us. It's, it's us, it's you, it's the community, it's whatever else can happen as far as, you know, not selling in places. And look what happened to tobacco. Tobacco was finding out in places like drug stores and, and in supermarkets and things like that, too. Um, but again, at the same time, I mean, and so the marketing, and I don't know if this was mentioned, uh, I just, I was floored by it. But the vaping companies are doing, um, they're providing scholarships for students. They get creative and doing some kind of a commercial for them, some kind of an ad. And then they wind up in a list of scholarships for kids to be able to receive. So, you know, here they are listed, whoever it is, like Jay or whoever it might be. Uh, which, again, look like every way you turn, they're somewhere, you know, trying to get into this somehow. Do you have a question? question? Yeah. yeah. So the nicotine bad that you had mentioned THC extract the them in their vapes also. Yeah. How common is that? I mean kids in high school are they doing that? Is that available to them? Um, I can't speak to specifically what's happening here, but I know Norton High School, um, they actually test everything that they confiscate and they do get um, products with THC, but not every school um, has the budget to test or does test, but yeah, so yeah. I'm not sure if you guys test for that here, but we currently no. do not test it. That's why actually it's so common as far as contact is concerned because mm -hmm. we can't be sure whether that's just just tobacco or whether um, it is one of the other products. Yeah. Any other questions? So um, if you haven't already, um, just make sure you take some of the paperwork that's out in the back. Um, there's a couple really good articles. The Surgeon General's report is printed out back there. Um, and I have cards if anyone wants one or needs to get in touch for anything. And I'd like to thank the Board of Health for bringing Marissa to us and partnering with thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me yeah, here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.